So it's uh, Sunday afternoon, and um, I know normal people like watch football or like work on their yards. Uh, my idea of relaxing is reading patents. Um, and so I kind of went down the rabbit hole of looking at some of the patents from Charles Sprinkle, uh, who did the JBL uh, M2 waveguide. And also the waveguide for the JBL 4367 and the uh, aperture, whatever you call it, on the um, Eon 615. And I noticed some interesting things. One of the most interesting things that I stumbled across, uh, I kind of had a difficult time describing online um, because it gets into some kind of um, crazy waveguide stuff that I think... Uh, how to put it, I, I probably spend more time making waveguides than the average person does. So uh, um, maybe this stuff seems um, a little bit more obvious to me than uh, the typical DIY or just kind of putting a two way together. But so, or then again, maybe everyone noticed and I'm the last person I noticed, but I just thought I'd put a video together to kind of describe what I saw in the patent, um, which wasn't so obvious at first glance. Okay, so let's see. Here we've got a, um, a QSC waveguide. This is a round waveguide. It's um, pretty pretty close to oblate spheroidal. Um, and uh, because of that, it's got pretty nice performance. It's got a really good polar response. Um, it's got good frequency response. It's big problem is that uh requires a really big center to center mounting, which makes it difficult to cross over. Uh, so for instance, this thing I think is about 10 inches in diameter. If you want to use half wavelength spacing with this thing, you need a crossover point of about 700 hertz. And it's hard to find uh, a tweeter that can play down that low. Of course, that's why I've done a bunch of uh, Unity horns and the like, but I was kind of fascinated by the, the sprinkle designs. So here's a 18 sound XT1086. Um, this is a, um, I, I guess it's pretty close to elliptical, not quite, but as you can see, the vertical is squashed and you can see there's a, a noticeable diffraction slot in there. So what the diffraction slot does is it, uh, widens the horizontal beam width, uh, by including the slot, uh, allows them to make it a little bit, uh, shorter, than they could have done otherwise. In other words, these two are kind of related. Um, there you go, two of them. Uh, but one has a diffraction slot and one doesn't. So one problem with the um, elliptical, with the non-symmetrical uh, shape is that the path length from the throat is not uh, equal. So I took this little piece of wire, show you what goes on. So here you can see the piece of wire reaches the edge on the horizontals, but as we get towards the bottom, you can see there's significantly more wire. And um, look right there. And this shouldn't be a big surprise um, because again, the waveguide is not symmetrical. It is shorter vertically than it is horizontally. Um, something, I, I'd pull out a uh, progressive transition waveguide or an M2 waveguide if I owned one, uh, but I don't. <laughs> I've made some that look kind of similar online. Um, a lot of them, a lot of waveguides I build just wind up in the trash. Uh, so at this moment, I don't have anything exactly similar to the M2, but let's take some, look at some pictures online. So something um, that wasn't immediately obvious to me about the M2 waveguide that kind of blew my mind is that, okay, so we got this curve here on the horizontal, but it's flat here. And um, I never quite realized why they're doing that. Um, as I saw it, this waveguide is basically a combination of two diffraction slots. So again, picture the diffraction slot in the XT1086. Then you got a diffraction slot here and a diffraction slot here. Uh, so it basically forms an X. Uh, so it's like, um, it's like a 
three-dimensional diffraction slot in the shape of an X. And you see the same X shape appear in a lot of Sprinkle's other designs. It shows up in the Eon 615 and it shows up in the JBL 4367. Um, but my big kind of mind-blown Eureka moment today was the realization that the flatness of the X um, compensates for the fact that this is longer, okay? So um, with a uh, with this circular path, um, because uh, this path length is longer, so by flattening it out, um, they are actually, um, what, what would be the word be? E they're equalizing the path length from here to here. And you would stop and think, well, you know, who cares? What's the point? Um, the point is this may improve the overall frequency response, particularly off axis. And so the, the reason why this is, is that, um, okay, so like, let's say that you're listening uh, 45 degrees off axis, right? So when you are doing that, the sound that travels down the center of the waveguide has to take this longer path, but the sound that goes down the, whoops, don't go to sleep. Um, the sound that has to go down the diagonal go down, goes down this flatter path. Um, and so again, that equalizes the path length from the tweeter to your ear. And uh, again, we're, you know, we're talking about a, as you saw over here with my little string, or actually it's a wire. Um, as you see over here, that path length difference that can be as little as, as um, you know, three quarters of an inch, uh, maybe an inch. But this actually kind of solves one of the great waveguide mysteries that has always baffled me. And that is that um, I have generally found that the bigger waveguides are, the worse they perform. Which is kind of a problem um, because the bigger that waveguides are, uh, to my ears, they, they tend to sound better, uh, better intelligibility, um, better imaging, uh, just bigger waveguides are better. And again, sonically, they seem to be better, but they don't measure that well. So for instance, this little 10-inch uh, QSC waveguide, uh, this thing measures really well, uh, but it can only load a tweeter down to about, probably about two kilohertz. So the mystery with the big waveguides, why do, why do the big waveguides measure worse? And now I'm starting to um, get it. Again, the equalization of the path lengths is very important because while this might only be a difference of about one inch, um, 13,500 hertz is an inch long. And when we have uh, when we have two sources of sound that are uh, out of phase by uh, 180 degrees, uh, they're going to create a dip in the response. So what that means is that if you have um, sound coming off the, uh, the horizontal and then some sound coming off the diagonal, uh, if those two sources are 180 degrees out of phase, um, they're going to create a dip. Um, and so again, a path length difference of just an inch could manifest itself as a dip at 6,750 Hertz. And this is, um, this is pretty consistent with the problems that I see, uh, with a lot of the larger waveguides. Um, so what I'll do on the DIY forum is I'll post some data to kind of demonstrate this, that the smaller waveguides... Uh, they, you know, reliably perform well. It's, it's pretty hard to screw up a small waveguide, but it's really hard to get the big waveguides to perform. So perhaps part of the reason that the big waveguides aren't performing as well as we'd like them to uh, is because of this path length difference. And in a nutshell, this equalization that we see in the, um, I think they call these, the JBL image control waveguide, uh, perhaps this equalization is more important um, than I'd previously realized. In fact, I never really had considered it before. I was kind of focused on the overall shape of the mouth 
but not necessarily on the path lengths.